But I'm often asked, why do I go back to the well to go and talk to people like David Shapiro, who we chatted with uh, in the past week, and now Koki Koiman? And the reason is because they are world class. And Koki has been four times uh, the fund manager of the year by a UK publication, four times. I'm not sure any other South African fund managers have even got close. But uh, that puts Corky in a league of his own when it comes to the financial sector. So, Corky, let's start off with the controversial stuff first, because I really want to get into banks and and the opportunities that uh, from an investor's perspective. But in the past week, we've had a lot of uh, furore around the South African banks, three in particular, uh, ABSA, Nedbank, and Standard Bank, being alleged or being accused by the chief rabbi. So this is this is like off the chart stuff of facilitating uh, payments or uh, financial transactions by Hamas, a terrorist organization. How seriously do you take this? Um, I have spoken with the banks, with the, um, with the CEOs, in fact, of, of the three of them, and all three of them vehemently deny any, anything that's been alleged. But from your perspective, you, you've got to be looking at these things from a risk perspective. Uh, basis and, and and how do you look at them? By the way, Corky runs a couple of unit trusts, uh, his own company, Denka, uh, the financial fund there, the global financial fund, and the feeder fund here in South Africa, and the Ned Group Investments financial fund as well. And we're going to be talking about both those in a moment. But let's let's start with this whole allegations about uh, about Iran, Hamas, and our banks. So Alec, yes, um, I had the same response as you, also from the banks. And, and obviously, client confidentiality, they can't tell you who their clients are unless obviously peanut or so or um, by the South African Reserve Bank uh, investigations. Or, but they assure me that um, obviously they'd be insane to go and, and fund a terrorist organization or somebody linked to a terrorist organization. So, um, but... Yeah, it is very really difficult to monitor while you screen every transaction as a bank, especially those increasing size. You do more homework and the system highlights suspicious transactions, especially if they occur regularly, so a regular funding pattern. Um, you know, they wouldn't knowingly do this. Uh, so uh, I'd be very surprised, but it is always possible that they were that someone in South Africa was making transfers to someone in London and the money from there went to Hamas or someone like that. Um, the Jerusalem Post actually did uh, research and look from their side, it's, it, it's clever, uh, if there is any truth in it. But in any case, as as an Israeli institution, you'd want to make sure that any funding to the opposition gets stopped. So they went and did their homework and making the allegations, but there's been no proof so far. Um, and I'm sure the banks are doing the investigations, but officially, and everything I hear so far, um, and I'd be surprised for them to be involved. So, yeah, we, we have not taken it that serious at this stage. And clearly the investment markets haven't either. We haven't seen the share prices of those banks falling off the table. Yeah, no, there have been too many other issues that that are worrying the markets. In fact, it hasn't been a nice market so far for uh, South African financials uh, year to date in January. Um, but that's more all to do with the, you know the political noise, uh, the possibility that NHI bill gets pushed through by Sir Ramaphosa. You know uh, the continued backlog in in railways and harbours. I mean those things. I think are playing a bigger role. And maybe the most important role being played at the moment is simply interest rates uh, and the U.S. dollar in the U.S. I don't know if you followed it that closely, but towards the end of last year, uh, November, December, specifically markets in the U.S. and globally were very, very strong, specifically financial shares. As it became clearer that we've reached the peak of the interest rate cycle, and markets were starting to look forward to interest rates being cut this year. And so far in January, because the markets ran up anticipating the cuts, 
all the uncertainty about inflation still being higher than, uh, well, they are coming down, but potentially staying higher. Uh, the Red Sea problems don't help in terms of costs of transport. Um, but so now the market is very occupied, let's put it, that's a good word, with what interest rates are going to do. When when the Fed uh, chair said this week that we won't see a cut in March, actually you saw the largest fall in the markets in, I think, in a few months. So I think it is silly, but short term those things make a difference. And I think SA banks have also been under pressure because of if US interest rates do fall, it is generally good for emerging markets. Not always, but it's generally good for emerging markets because our interest rates then come down. We attract more capital coming in. That's good for your banking sector. If they stay high, the rent could stay weak and we won't attract capital. Well, there's another reason why investors won't come into South Africa then. But So that's not good for your financial sector. So the dollar is almost an interest rate to use, almost more important short term for our market and the financial sector. Lots of complexities and uh, lots of moving parts. But let's just finish off with the South African banks and the uh, Hamas allegations. If the Jerusalem Post is right, and if if uh, these banks have been facilitating transactions to Hamas, what are the implications of that? We know South Africa is already grey-listed, and we know that South Africa seems to be pretty close to the one side in the whole Middle East fight. So we were invested in two banks that um, were in similar situations. One was Sweat Bank in, in Sweden and the other one ING. And, and so actually before they did a high fight in Austria, in each of the cases they were involved or their clients were caught to be money laundering in the Sweat Bank's case, it was Russian clients that were moving money to Latvia and Estonia with Sweat Bank have a subsidiary. These activities took place in the late 90s, early 2000, 2005, 2006. So that's how long it took for the investigation to take place. And the systems at that stage weren't good enough to highlight the money laundering activities to management. And so they were found guilty and were severely fined, both locally, by the local regulator, and by the US regulator. Your worst case, if, if, you, if you're found to be doing this and no action is taken, that the US authorities could sanction the bank. So let's say APSA decides, what we're going to bow to political pressure and we will fund Hamas institutions. So then you could find that um, the US authorities say, okay, no more... Uh, that we sanction uh, abscess. Alan Pullinger, actually, as a matter of fact, end of last year, when there was the whole weapons transaction problem in the in South Africa, made a point of going to Washington and showing his presentation slides to say that we as a bank sector are opposed to these things. We're doing what we can to, um, to interact with the government, warning of, of the events or uh, casualties that could come of being seen in America being too close to Russia, as an example, and actually made that point. And he said to me, well, are we preparing for the day that we've got to go to Washington? He said, listen, guys, we've been against this the whole time. Don't sanction the banking sector. Uh, you know, if you want to target anybody, target our government, not the bank sector. So the banks are really involved, very worried that the U.S. could actually take action and just say, okay, U.S. banks are not allowed to trade with SA banks. So that's the worst case that could happen. Interesting. You you uh, refer to Alan Pullinger, the outgoing CEO of First Rand. First Rand was not named uh, amongst the banks that had been facilitating Hamas, which is in, in itself interesting. And then when I have a look at your portfolio, uh, your Net Group Investments portfolio, and and I think it's it's worth just explaining that what the Ned Group do is they get what is called best of breed. So they'll go to the people that they believe are the best in different sectors and you, you the financial sector, and then they will ask you to run money for their clients in that sector. And in that portfolio, by far your biggest holding is first grand. So it, it looks like, uh, well, certainly on that one, you've, <laughs> you've, you've got it right, but ha have, they out have they continued to outperform first grand? And indeed, I've seen it's down... 
from the late 70s to the kind of mid 60s in the last little while, is it just nothing really immune to the sickness that uh, South African banks seem to be feeling because of the economy? Yeah. Uh, South African banks have actually been, I, I just looked at the numbers again, but let's say on average down 5% uh, year to date, make it 3, 4. First round have been the hardest hit, down 9. Uh, last year, first round did quite well. It went up 18. Uh, Standard Bank actually 24. Uh, but the other banks were uh, absolutely its own problems with the, the Ghana reinvestment in Ghanaian bonds. First round has been hit this year by an investigation into malpractices, not directly of themselves, but into the motor leasing industry in the UK. And it seems that the the chain and the banks are part of the chain of, of selling or, or providing motor leasing to clients. Um, the commission structures did not favor clients, to put it that way. <laughs> and there's an investigation whether the banks overcharged. And uh, they used to have Motor Novo, uh, which they've now merged with uh, the outlet in the UK. And so first rent could be fined up to, its calculations so far showed up to 3 to 5% of the earnings, of one year's earnings. So one will fine if it happens, but these the investigations group. have- The whole group. The whole group, group says. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. so this is a big fine. This is a big fine. It's obviously Lloyd's uh, in the UK is the hardest hit, and then some of the smaller banks, but the invest investigation goes back to- from 2007, uh, the practices were stopped, I think, a few years ago, but so nobody knows the size of the possible fine, even the size of the transactions. It's just started, so the market initially always assumes the worst, um, but that's really why first round is down too much. There's a massive fine potentially coming their way, or and they'll flag that at the next results call, I'm quite sure. So that's the main reason why it's down so much. Cookie, aren't these companies just too big now? Because things seem to be going well. And then, as you mentioned earlier, ABSA has a problem in Ghana. Ghana, for heaven's sake, which is a fraction of its major, of its business. And now the, there's, a, there's a problem that First Rand picks up in its UK subsidiary, which owns a motor operation, which has gotten into trouble. Again, it's, it's like... Something just is going to seems to be popping out of the woodwork somewhere. And when you're so big, and getting back to what we said earlier about the whole Hamas uh, funding situation, when you're so big, how do you keep tabs on everything? How do you actually control everything? And how do you avoid these big problems coming out if you are a management and B as watching as an investor? Yeah. So. That's a very good point. So there are a few points there important. Number one is you've got to make sure that you've got very good people on the ground. Uh, Paul Harris, previous CEO of, of um, First Strand, always said famously that, and if you recall, he actually went across to Australia to start setting up something for First Strand in Australia, and it failed. And he said, you know, the mistake we make as South Africans when we invest offshore we branch out of shore, we send our B team. <laughs> and our B team then competes to the local A team. If you want to go and compete offshore, you've got to send your best guys. Yeah. Um, and so number one, that's very really important, that uh, you have very really good guys on the ground. Uh, but even then, uh, the, ga the Ghana problem to APSA was not much they could have done about. Uh, you know, once you're in Ghana and Ghana defaults on its debt, you know, every bank gets difference between Ghana and Standard Bank is that for Ghana, it was a very large percentage of their African earnings. For Standard Bank, because they're more diversified, it's a lot smaller. Um, there are a few other problems as well, but so there's a second answer. If you're going to go offshore, um, it is better, like Standard Bank and Sunlum have done that very well as well, is to just diversify it to have a portfolio spread. So for Standard Bank, if Zambia blows up, which it did actually last year, it also defaulted, uh, it, it's small. Uh, if Kenya, yeah, so you want to do portfolio effect. But you are right. The world has changed in 
the regulators, the regulatory oversight is getting worse and worse and worse. And that's for retailers, that's for bankers, that's for insurers. And um, you've got to make sure your compliance and, and legal teams have become very, very important to make sure um, that you know, operators on the ground are playing by the local regulations and rules and don't put you at risk. It just seems that you can get too big. There can come a time when you are just too big. And, uh, and even though a relatively small part of your business, you're so big that a, a small part of your business goes wrong and it has an imp- a massive, massive impact. But I guess that's, that's, yeah, that's what it is. Hey? You, you, if you're going to invest in these behemoths, you have to take the rough with the smooth. Yeah. I mean, just to end that off, if you think of Standard Bank or Sunlum for that matter, the two most successful in terms of growing offshore, growing into emerging markets now, um, Standard Bank, I think it's more than soon, more than 50% of its earnings will be out of South Africa. It's outside South Africa. For Sunlum, I think close to a third of earnings already come from Sheram in India. Sheram's market cap is now bigger than that of Sunlum. <laughs> so they have created enormous wealth for the investors, for the shareholders by doing this successfully. So could Sunlum have just stayed in South Africa and just be big but don't grow? Um, or do you go offshore? And that's really what they, they're batting with the whole time. Yeah. You know? I've got to throw but something going at offshore you there. brings risk. You, you know uh, Warren Buffett went to India and he ran away. He went, He was very excited about it, went there, said, too corrupt, and he, he didn't even finish his trip. He, he just went straight home. Sunlam is operating in India. It's now the biggest part of the business. We've seen some real scary stories, uh, you know, the Hindenburg uh, invest, investigation recently, for instance, in India. How safe is this, Shiram, this part of Sunlam? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting thing. Johan van Sale will confirm this. Uh, we were actually invested in our a global financial fund in Sheeran before Sunlum found them in 2003. So, and what struck us with these guys, very ethical uh, management team, uh, very strong on culture, and it, by chance that someone met them as well and, and by a third party and started talking and said, hey, you know, we share the same culture. Uh, we've got a lot of expertise in South Africa about the insurance industry. You don't have anything and let's just work together. And that's how it grew and it, and it kept growing. All my interactions with him over the, what is it now? It was 21 years. Um, have shown that initial assessment to be correct, that uh, they like doing things the right way. The, the, the RJ, the, the CEO, not chairman, is a very ethical man, although you often think that of people and you, you know, most people thought that of Marcus Ewers at the, at the, in the early stage. But yeah, so from the outside judging, um, I would say that is so. But India is is high risk. It is high risk. Is, uh, but the regulator and the Reserve Bank, they are, are very, very on top of things. It's, um, but there's always a risk. Uh, and the longer you get to know the people and work with them, and some of executives spend a lot of time in Mumbai, in Delhi, uh, talking to the guys, being at the board meetings, being on the ground. So, yeah. But you can't just sit in South Africa and say, we've got this investment in the country. Could it be Sunlum's equivalent of Naspers's ten cent? In other words, Naspers had an investment in ten cent. It became even far bigger than Naspers itself. And today, uh, the Naspers share price is more than accounted for just by its investment in ten cent. Could there be a similar uh, situation here with Sunlum and Shira? Yeah, you'll see in that NetBank fund, uh, Sunlum is actually our largest after first round. I think it's the third largest, but there are also constraints in terms of the index. So in, I don't have to go into technicalities, but if we're not allowed to be more have an investment more than 10% of the fund in Sunlum unless market movements take it there. And I think it's gone to 12% and we happen to just sit with that. So um, my own personal opinion is that uh, Shearham, the value of Shearham inside Sunlum is still not recognized by the market. But they've got a very strong growing um, business. Uh, they purchased the transport business, the motor um, scooter business, uh, the insurance business, all into one Shearham 
uh, finance. And um, that business is growing at roughly 15% per annum. In a country that is growing nominally 12% per annum, real at 6%, it's, it's a huge gem for some of them to have, for some of the investors to have exposure to that, similar to NASPERS uh, with Tencent. You're quite right. But I think the interesting thing between Chinese, and I've just read the book on Tencent, <laughs> if you compare the two governments, the Indian government is free press, a very open critical press, a socialist background, but capitalist society, um, very competitive and China's very controlled uh, government-led economy, very strongly controlled by government, uh, limited information. So the two the two societies are vastly different. Just to close off with, and uh, we'll stay with Sunlam. I know it's part of your family, but uh, there is a big deal today, uh, a multi-billion rand deal with the acquisition of Asupol. Uh, now that's I a, just a interesting. Do you know the company Asupol at all? I actually, funny enough, I do. Rion van Dijk was CEO there for a number of years and built it up. And I happen to know Rion from the days when he was at Momentum. And uh, we were up in, in, in Gauteng visiting the banks and the CEOs. And I, we had a spare afternoon. I said to my team, let's go and see Rion and see how he's doing. And they've actually built up. Ashapol is the old South African police force uh, insurance operation. And part of their own strategy after a few years, I said, but we've got something good here. We've built up good systems. Let's go and market to third parties. And they built us into a very good business for the lower end of the market, uh, very good systems. Rion, by the way, is now at Sunman. And I don't know if there's a connection there, uh, head of their IT strategy. And uh, I'm sure he started talking to them and, and they said to him, but if this is such a good business that you've built up, why don't we go and buy it? And that would be my assumption. I've just seen the headline today, but from what the interviews we've had with Rion in those days, I would say it's actually a very good uh, transaction. Yeah. Bear in mind that some of them lost the Capitec business uh, when Capitec ended that contract. So it could also be a way of getting back into the in, uh, funeral insurance policies and that type of business. But also so part it's a good the, move from Sunnum. Part of the whole strategy, Brightrock. Uh, the acquisition there, which uh, hopefully is doing well as well. Um, and Paul Hanratty will be a happier man. If you recall, when he first arrived there, he did a, I mean, there's so many parallels here with Kurs Becker and, and Naspers. We've, we've spoken about Shiram in India, but Hanratty saying, I'll take a small salary and a lot of shares. And to begin with, he didn't look too clever, but my goodness, after last year's performance, he certainly is looking a lot, uh, um, you know, pretty, pretty wise. Yeah. No, it was a, I think it was a top performer, a top of South, a financial share in South Africa going up, what is it, 40 or 49%. But bear in mind, the year before, it was a bad year because of all the COVID claims, mortality claims. So it, it was a recovery from a low base, but you're right. Uh, and Salem, I think, is still good value. And is, I, think, I think it's one of the best positioned businesses in, in South Africa. Uh, and I, I've worked for Denker. <laughs> uh, they're my cousins there. But... Um, yeah, so I'm objective in saying that. Koki Koiman is with Denker Capital. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 